the joy of freedom is uh, the, the way Milton Friedman put it in his blurb was it's a quasi autobiographical <laughs> making of the case for freedom. And I think that's accurate. When I've taught people over the years, what I've learned is people come to their belief in freedom in lots of different ways. It's a particular experience they had that they paid attention to and learned from and so on. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat? Well, in fact, it does relate to Milton Friedman. Milton and Rose Friedman had a book called uh, Free to, uh, it called um, Free to Choose a Personal Statement. And I've read the book a couple times. There's not much personal in there. And I thought, what would be a personal statement? Well, my book. And so it's kind of how I came to believe in freedom, how I see the power of freedom in solving people's problems, my stories that influence me from not famous people and famous people that make the case for freedom. So that, that was the idea. And so I purposely avoided in points at points in the book, which is hard for me to do. I purposely avoided getting in arguments. I didn't want to argue. I just wanted to say, here's what I think. And so when people, friends would comment on chapters and they'd say, but you could have said this in response to that argument. And I said, I know I could have, but that's not what the book is. It, I don't want it to come across as an argument. I want it to come across as, a, as an odyssey. And so that's why I wrote it the way I did. Well, I want to precede that by saying who's the person I've learned the most from. And I think that was Ayn Rand. I don't buy her whole system, but I learned in this basic way that she made me think about things I would have never thought about. And I think that on many of the issues, she's basically got it right. And I don't think, I was not a big reader before reading Ayn Rand. And I think I went from reading maybe four books a year, mainly novels, to reading almost a book a week for a few years in economics, history, political science, um, occasionally philosophy, although I found those harder. So I think that set the framework for everything else. And then within economics, I would say Milton Friedman. I remember when I read Capitalism and Freedom, I was um, about 18. 1718, and it just was exciting. Well, actually, I found it by reading his Newsweek column. I, I even remember the column. It was titled, The Public Be Damned. And I thought, ooh, this reminds me of a little scene in Atlas Shrugged. And it wasn't that at all, but it was still very good. It was basically saying, people say that businessmen have the view of the public be damned, but the real entity that has the view of the public be damned is the government. And he talked about the post office and how they don't care about customers and so on. And I went, who is this guy who gets to be in Newsweek? And then I discovered Capitalism and Freedom. And these were the days when copying, we called it Xeroxing in those days, cost 25 cents a page. So I was very selective about which pages I copied. And then I realized, you know what, this is crazy. Spend the six ninety five and, and order the book. And uh, so that was a huge book. I remember his, a chapter on occupational licensing and saying, look, if I'm going to make the case against government requiring licenses to be in a profession, I don't want to take the easiest case. I want to take the hardest case. And the hardest case is doctors. And he laid it out beautifully. I remember following my mother around our little apartment, reading it not to her but at her. I mean, she had no interest, but I was so excited about this, this segment of that chapter. So I'd say that one. When I got to UCLA, absolutely the one there who influenced me the most was Armin Elchin. He had written this textbook with a guy named William Allen that's just like no other textbook. It's just um, profound, subtle. There's no way you can use it for a typical undergraduate class, I learned. Uh, it's just too far beyond. And in fact, I prepared it when I was a TA for an undergraduate class. I prepared for every question they could have asked me from the back of each chapter, which they never did. But in preparing it, I learned so much economics, and it helped me with my, my uh, qualifying exams in, in the PhD program. And the man just thought so clearly. It was one of the first real indicators in economics to me that you could both be 
completely rigorous and use words. You can be rigorous without a single equation. And Armin Elshin, I think, demonstrated that more than almost anyone else. So I would say that person. And then I guess I would have to reach back and say Henry Hazlitt, because he was one of the first people I read his book, Economics in One Lesson. It was recommended by Ayn Rand in one of her newsletters. And it was just this clear thinking. And again, it's not as if I'd been thinking about these issues. I was 17 or 18. But he got me thinking about these issues. It's like, wow, you know, I've kind of heard this argument that if you take longer to do something, you create more jobs. And that kind of made sense to me. But it never totally made sense to me. There was something in my brain saying that doesn't totally make sense. And Henry Hazlitt laid out clearly why it doesn't make sense. And he was drawing on Frederick Bastier before him. And, and so those kinds of things that just drove it home. So I would say those three thinkers. I'd have to say Karl Marx. I mean, Karl Marx's <coughs> labor theory of value is wrong. The value of something doesn't derive from the labor put into it. It derives from people's subjective preferences. Once you say the labor theory of value is wrong, there's not that much left of a system. Also, there was his idea of diminishing investment opportunities, which has turned out not to be true. I mean, just innovation after innovation happens and it creates huge investment opportunities. So I would say I disagree with him more than almost anyone else in economic, more than anyone else I can think of in economics. I would say John Maynard Keynes in the sense that I, I think he really set economics back. I think he set it back more than Marx did because people came along pretty quickly and refuted Marx. People like Eugene von Bawerk, the Austrian economist, but uh, people didn't come along to refute Keynes to nearly the same extent. And I thought Keynesianism was almost dead. And this latest recession and the so-called stimulus bill and so on and the arguments that various economists have made for it make me realize that it, it is not dead. So I, as far as economists who have influenced the profession, and I think Marx really hasn't ultimately, I would have to say John Maynard Keynes. Right now, I think the most interesting one is airline security. I think it's just gone. It's amazing to me how far the US government has gone, where they're actually taking naked pictures of people and insisting that the government be able to have their agents grope people. And that's really what it is. I have friends who travel a lot, and it really is groping in many cases. And so I've been thinking about these issues a lot how do you handle airline security in a free society? And so I blogged about it a little on my blog. I've spoken about it in interviews, but always what comes up is yes, but, and there's some other piece. And I thought, why not put it all together? So have a really comprehensive treatment of all the issues. And that's what I'm in the midst of. I gave my first presentation of it last week at San Jose State University, their economics colloquium there, and it went pretty well. There are a lot of good suggestions for improvements, so it's not as far along as I thought it was, but that's really what I'm working on right now.